everybody, and welcome to the webinar, Is Your HR Department a Ticking Antitrust Time Bomb? Uh, my name is Jennifer Trulock, and I chair the Labor and Employment Practice Group here at Baker Botts. And we are all very excited to talk about a topic where human resources and antitrust intersect. And you wouldn't think necessarily that's a big enough area for a webinar of its own, but um, the Department of Justice Antitrust Division has signaled that it is going to announce cases that they're going to criminally prosecute that involve either no poaching agreements or wage fixing <clears throat> agreements, and that's a big deal. So that's gonna give us definitely something big to talk about today. So let me introduce my colleagues from the antitrust group here at the firm. We have Tom Fina, who's a partner in our antitrust group who has a significant amount of experience re representing companies before competition agencies around the world, and Joy Ostoyich, who chairs the litigation department in D.C., and he spends his time litigating antitrust issues in bet the company cases. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg with these two accomplished lawyers. They have a lot of knowledge to share on the topic that we're going to talk about today. So if I can get to the overview slide, I'll kind of go over what we're going to talk about from a broader perspective. Um, today we're gonna go through the guidance that was issued by the Department of Justice and the FTC jointly back in October of 2016. And what we're gonna do is break down what you need to know and why you know, what may seem to be a simple conversation between competitors could be a red flag conversation that could carry potential criminal liability. Um, we're gonna talk about some safeguards that will be helpful um, for you to know. We'll talk about some general guidance and some common scenarios that you may want some help with. And then we'll be glad to talk through any questions that you may have at the end. And so while we're, while we're talking through things, um, if you have a question, be sure to email Caitlin Letty, and that should be on the link in the calendar invitation to the webinar that you got with the WebEx login or the email, but it's K-A-I-T-L-I-N dot L-E-D-D-Y at BakerBots.com. So Tom, do you wanna get us started on the guidance? Uh, Jennifer, yes, thank you. Um, my name's Tom Fien, I'm here in Washington, D.C. Um, as some of you may know, the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission released a document called Antitrust Guidance for Human Resource Professionals uh, last fall, back in October of, uh, of 2016. Uh, the key statement uh, in that short document is, quote, going forward, DOJ intends to proceed criminally against naked wage fixing or no poaching agreements. That's just a single sentence, it's just one sentence, but it announces a major change in enforcement policy um, by the Department of Justice. Historically, these violations have been punished civilly uh, and settled typically with, uh, with consent orders. With the publication of this guidance back in 2016, DOJ is putting the business community and the legal community on notice that they're moving from civil to criminal sanctions and enforcement. And this is, this is what the antitrust division typically does. When there's a change in policy of this magnitude, uh, it signals uh, to the business community and to the legal community what it's doing. Um, at a recent conference a couple of weeks ago, um, the head of the antitrust uh, division stated that the Department of Justice is getting ready to announce criminal indictments for employee no poach agreement. So the department has announced that they're gonna do it uh, and now, uh, now criminal indictments uh, are, are going to be pending. This creates some very significant criminal antitrust risk for companies in a wholly new area, uh, human resources and, and hiring employees where it simply didn't exist before. Um, the, the, the fines uh, and penalties for criminal violations of the antitrust laws are, are very significant. Um, corporate fines of 100 million plus, uh, individual fines of a million dollars plus, 
uh, jail terms for individuals who are involved uh, of up to 10 years. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's always follow-on private civil trouble damages uh, lawsuits um, that might be brought by affected employees. But I want to pause and, and focus for a minute on the, on the jail terms here. Um, it, it's a very real risk um, with the antitrust division. The Department of Justice, and in particular the antitrust division, is focused on sending to jail senior culpable employees. Um, the average sentence is, is uh, a little less than two years. Um, and the antitrust division regularly sends a couple of dozen people uh, to jail uh, each year for criminal violations of the antitrust laws. Uh, the division firmly believes that jail time uh, is, is the best deterrent. Um, the, uh, the antitrust guidance also cautions against sharing of sensitive information, such as compensation information, uh, either with competitors, with other companies, um, uh, and through third-party entities such as trade associations uh, or industry groups. So it's, it's clear that this is a major enforcement initiative um, being brought by the antitrust division. And as we'll discuss shortly, uh, this really has the potential to reach the highest levels uh, of the C-suite, uh, including CEOs. Um, at the conference uh, on the 19th, the uh, uh, newly confirmed Assistant Attorney General uh, uh, made public that DOJ has been very active in looking at uh, these non-poaching agreements. And he went on to say that in the coming months, um, uh, we're going to see criminal indictments. And surprisingly, he said there were going to be a lot of them. He said he was, going to be, he was shocked by how many of them uh, there would be. Um, my private practice experience over the last 30 years is that no poach agreements are common when the labor market is tight uh, or competition for certain types of employees is tight, whether those are engineers or nurses or, or whatever. Um, and uh, these no poach agreements often occur when one CEO calls up another CEO um, and expresses concern that uh, his, his competitor is hiring away uh, his employees. Um, Moving on to page seven, um, this is just some statements from some senior antitrust division officials uh, about the criminal indictments that are, um, that are here to come. Uh, I think a common theme um, in these statements is surprise over the number uh, of no poach agreements that, uh, that exist and, and surprise uh, over the number of cases that are, uh, that are gonna be brought. Um, Turning to page eight, um, let's talk for a minute about one no poach investigation, um, uh, which has been uh, uh, discussed publicly in the media. Um, the Department of Justice apparently is reportedly investigating whether or not Barclays and J.P. Morgan uh, entered into a no poach agreement. Um, the uh, the backstory here is is interesting. Uh, Jess Staley was hired as CEO of Barclays back in 2015 from Wall Street. He was new to Barclays and he was new to banking in the, uh, in the UK. Um, after he was hired as CEO of Barclays, there were a string of high-level departures from J.P. Morgan uh, to Barclays uh, after, after Staley was hired. In, 19, uh, or in 2017, rather, uh, the Financial Times reported that uh, the head of J.P. Morgan called Barclays chairman uh, to complain about the defections. So here you've got you know, very high level, um, very senior employees, executives, uh, calling each other about a no poach agreement. And the question that the government's investigating is, is did Barclays senior executives uh, promise to do no further, uh, no further hiring? And we don't know the answer to that yet, um, but that may be one of the cases that will be announced in the, uh, in the coming months. Jen, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. So there, um, you know, what's, what's the problem here that they're trying to address? And the guidance is looking at, at generally two types of agreements that are a problem. 
And the, the first type is what's called a no poaching agreement. And that is when one company agrees with another company that it won't, you know, the two of them won't either hire or solicit for hire the other company's agree, uh, employees. And so that's, that's pretty clear, you know, that they're just going to avoid hiring each other. And that's, you know, that's an issue because you're essentially removing choice from the employees at those companies um, about places where they might be able to go and work, right? So that's an issue. And then the second type of agreement that's a problem is agreeing with another company about um, the amount of an employee or position salary or wages or any other term of compensation. And that includes either an agreement about, okay, we're going to offer you know, uh, 65000 for this particular um, role or to a range. And I thought it was interesting that the guidance offered as a specific example for compensation, you know, um, CEO X was tired of offering a gym membership as part of the compensation package for X type of positions. And, um, but he knew that if he didn't offer that gym membership, you know, employees would still get it, you know, from all of his competitors. So he wanted to call his competitors and see if they would consider not offering the gym membership either. And the DOJs, you know, that was in one of their proposed Q&As, and they said, no, you know, you can't, you can't do that. That would be, you know, an inappropriate wage-fixing agreement. So those are, those are the two types that are specifically identified. So Tom, do you want to talk about some of the some of the additional issues that were identified? Um, yeah, let's let's talk about how the antitrust law analyzes um, restraints on on competition like this. There are basically two forms of, of analysis. The first is so-called rule of reason analysis, which is basically a balancing test where you look at the pro-competitive value of the restraint versus the anti-competitive effects that the restraint. Um, may have, um, and that's the that's the typical form of antitrust analysis of uh, uh, for restraints and competition. Um, the uh, the second type of analysis is called you know per se analysis, and here um, uh, when something is declared per se illegal, and so a variety of uh, a variety of different actions are, are per se illegal. Um, they include things like weight, uh, bid rigging, price fixing, uh, customer allocation, market allocation. Those are things that the courts have found over the years and uh, you know, the common law uh, uh, has held are, are simply per se illegal. When something is per se illegal, you don't look to the purpose, the intent, the rationale, um, or the reason for the illegal agreement. It doesn't matter. If, if the agreement exists, that in itself uh, is illegal. And so what the government is saying here with respect to mo no poaching agreements and wage fixing agreements, the government is saying that those are per se illegal offenses. And it, it doesn't matter, um, you know, even if the, uh, uh, the restraints, if the rationale for the restraint is a desire to cut costs or to reduce turnover, um, uh, when something is per se illegal, uh, there's simply no defense to it. Hi, everybody. This is Joe Astoy from the Baker Botts, Washington, D.C. office. So, look, this is a fascinating development. We have sort of two strains of antitrust law that are coming head to head with this. One is the desire to keep costs low. So, if you're a manufacturer or in any business, you try to keep your costs low. And the reason is if your costs are lower, that allows you more flexibility to price lower. That's good for consumers. It promotes the competitive process. It's good for competition, obviously encouraged by the antitrust laws. On the other hand, you have to make your decisions unilaterally. So if you are buying any input product, whether it is a raw material in a manufacturing plant or labor, you are purchasing something, and you have to make those decisions independently. And you cannot agree with your competitors on how much you will purchase, at what price you will purchase it. So, so we have these conflicting strains that hit head on, and I think the political climate of the last couple of years has really ratcheted up the focus on domestic job creation, 
stagnant wages and, and uh, tight labor market right now that have really put a lot of, of emphasis on this. And so we're going to continue to see this kind of strong focus by the antitrust division. The guidance that came out last fall was the first explicit acknowledgement that labor would be treated like any other input and would be subject to the antitrust laws. And it is the full panoply of the antitrust enforcement toolkit. Everything they can do, they will do, and they will enforce if they have an opportunity to. So for example, if it is a naked price fixing agreement or wage fixing agreement or, or no poach agreement or a gym membership inclusion in your pay package agreement, if there is no purpose other than to fix the price of that, or whether it's included or not, as we discussed, it'll be criminally prosecuted. But there are a whole lot of things that are short of that that will be civilly prosecuted. Uh, think of an ancillary agreement to an M&A transaction. A buyer is looking at purchasing a seller. During the due diligence process, the seller may very well say, gee, I don't want you to be able to hire my key employees while you're looking under the tent to, to understand my business better. So please agree not to do that. That's ancillary to what presumably is a pro-competitive transaction or has some other legitimate redeeming value. And so would probably not be subject to criminal prosecution, but very well could be something that someone might poke into and ask, well, is that ancillary? Is it narrowly tailored and so forth? Um, they will also use uh, FTC Act Section 5, invitations to collude. So, so if a company publicly announces in an analyst call, we are looking at lowering our uh, expense to acquire certain types of key uh, uh, members of our labor force, uh, graphic engineers, whatever it is. That could be a way that signals to others in the industry that they should hold the line on, on salary increases. So, so just be conscious of this will be, I think, the first time that we will see the full brunt of the Department of Justice, the FTC, and private plaintiffs, and probably state AGs, all looking at the same time to focus on, on what amounts to hiring employees and what to pay them. The reason we think this is worthwhile for all of you to focus on is my guess is that most of your HR departments have not been trained under your antitrust compliance program. Historically, there just was not a lot of focus on that. There wasn't a lot of need to do that. I think at this point, you should step one, if you take anything away from this, this uh, webinar, you should think about making sure that your HR people, anyone who's involved in your hiring decisions, gets trained on the, anti the basic antitrust laws. And, and Joe, I think, I think I would add there um, to HR, um, I would add that your senior executives, your CEO and, and your most senior executives in the C-suite um, need to have that training as well and need to understand that picking up the phone and entering into a gentleman's agreement with one of their competitors uh, could, be a, could be a criminal violation. Yep, absolutely, no question about that. So, so we've got a couple of examples on this slide of what has been the subject of a civil enforcement action. So, so I hope most of you, your, your, all of your business people recognize that an out-and-out, flat-out agreement let's not hire more of X, or let's not pay them more of, than Y, that can subject you to criminal prosecution. Not, not a good idea, obviously. But the civil basket of conduct is much broader and much vaguer. It includes things like you see in this high-tech litigation slide, an agreement not to poach each other's employees. Doesn't mean you've agreed not to hire, right? So you could receive, passively receive a CV, and decided to hire someone from a competitor, but you've agreed not to actively solicit and poach your competitor's employees. So it is goes in the direction of a flat-out agreement that would restrict the demand for, for labor, but it doesn't go quite all the way. So that was prosecuted civilly and was the subject of private antitrust class action lawsuits, which ultimately resulted in a lot of money being paid and a lot of headaches uh, being incurred. So that's one example. The one below it, um, it is uh, very common, actually, in the healthcare industry for nurses and other professionals to be subject to all sorts of scrutiny and industry-wide efforts to understand better what the right pay range is. And as part of that, 
a lot of information gets shared among hospitals and other medical groups. And the sharing of information, even if it is, does not result in an explicit agreement, I agree with you that neither one of us will pay more than X for uh, a registered nurse or an emergency uh, room professional. Even without that agreement, the sharing of information can subject you to civil liability because it is a way that um, could, could in effect have a price dampening effect or an effect that, that dampens the demand for for uh, the wage. So, so that those are two common examples. This is another one that's a little bit older uh, in the um, uh, petroleum industry. There was properly uh, sort of a third party was hired, a, a, a well-known third party to conduct industry surveys of certain positions. The information that came out of that was discussed at trade association meetings. There was no agreement that everybody would adhere to a certain price schedule according to the complaint, but it was discussed and the information was shared. And there was an assurance that the information would be used in some fashion or other, not necessarily that everybody would agree to pay the same price. This case survived the motion to dismiss, which means you then have the headache and the cost and the expense of discovery and ultimately got thrown out after uh, a couple years of litigation. The cases, a bunch of cases got filed, they got consolidated, class certification was denied, and ultimately summary judgment was granted. But that was probably a couple years and an awful lot of money down the road. So again, just from a broad perspective, it would be useful to put your HR practices under a microscope to figure out what your risk profile is. And that's most likely something that uh, a lot of companies have not done because it just has not been a big focus of, of enforcement. So we're focusing on this today and we think this is going to be timely because as you heard a couple minutes ago, the Department of Justice has, has uh, publicly stated a couple times in the last few weeks that they expect to announce their first criminal indictments in this sphere quickly, soon. That, again, is a sea change. I think this would represent the first criminal prosecution. We don't know the shape of it yet. We don't know whether it's wage fixing. We don't know whether there's a no poach agreement. But all that will become uh, public shortly. And we expect there to be a number of these in the queue. So we expect to hear this sort of a common refrain over the next six months to a year. Um, we know that there are dozens of investigations going forward. And we also expect that there will be a lot of civil cases as well. Plus, whenever you get a Department of Justice or FTC investigation, I hope no one on the phone has to deal with this, but every time you get one of those, surprise, surprise, you get a lot of private plaintiffs in the class action bar pile in as well. So, so this will be an ongoing area to watch as these various matters develop. And, and as I said a minute ago, I expect state AGs to start to weigh in as well. It is. Um, it is easy to pile on once the federal government takes an action and just about everybody who can bring an action will think about bringing the action. Um, just to focus in on this, Jennifer mentioned the gym membership. So the, the precise language in the guidance that the Department of Justice and FTC have, have given out covers just about every aspect of the terms of employment. So it is the amount of people you will hire, it is whether you will hire, and then it is just about everything else that rolls into salary or wage. So let me just read you a quote. Job benefits such as gym membership, parking, transit subsidies, meals, meal subsidies, and similar benefits of employment are all elements of employee compensation. So an agreement on any one of those, if it's a naked agreement with no other purpose, could be criminally prosecuted. So if, for example, you're a member of a trade association, the trade association says, gee, to hire a certain type of employee, it would be useful to know what other companies in the industry are doing. Are they offering free gym memberships, meal subsidies, travel expenses? How do they treat frequent flyer mileage if our employees are flying all over the globe? Let's all do the same thing. That can be, uh, at this point, can be subject to the DOJ or FTC prosecution. Obviously, not all of these agreements are problematic. Most of them, you hope, should be judged under the rule of reason. As with 
all Sherman Act Section 1, uh, the vast majority of, of agreements are judged under the rule of reason, and there are often legitimate reasons. I mentioned one a minute ago, uh, an agreement that's ancillary to a legitimate M&A transaction um, probably passes muster, shouldn't have a problem, provided it's, it's reasonable to the, to the uh, pro-competitive effect of the overall deal and narrowly tailored. So if you have an M&A transaction in one part of your business, you're buying a competitor in one division, for example, that doesn't necessarily justify a, a restriction on poaching in a different division, right? Because that would be narrowly tailored. But in general, there will be lots of these types of arrangements that are pretty common that should pass muster. The key issue for your purposes is make sure your HR department is looped in, make sure your top executives are looped in, and make sure you in the legal department go through carefully and analyze so you, you can better understand the risk that you face. Uh, information sharing, so in a broad sense, information sharing is not illegal by itself under Sherman Act Section 1. Um, just sharing the information, just finding out what your competitor charges on the sales outside obviously leaves you free to independently decide to price at the same level, price below and steal market share, or price higher if you want to position your product as a premium product. So just bilaterally sharing information or as part of a trade association is not by itself an agreement, but it certainly heads in the direction, right? So as part of common HR practices, benchmarking is a normal thing to do, and benchmarking is an information sharing that could either lead to an agreement or even if it doesn't lead to an agreement, could have a price dampening effect that would spur a civil investigation. There are a couple of ways to protect yourself. One is to follow the guidance, the safe harbors that the Department of Justice and the FTC have given out in other contexts, in the healthcare context, for example, and that would be hire a third party, a reputable third party, to gather the information, gather information from at least five different companies in or out of your industry, um, in a way that no one company has 25% or more of the, of the market. Um, you have the third party aggregate the information so it can't be reverse engineered before it gets disseminated. So you can't figure out what your direct competitors are charging. And then preferably have the information be a little bit stale, right? Ideally, ideally more than six months stale uh, if worse comes to worse and the markets are moving too quickly for that, try and make it at least three months stale. But the older, the more aggregated, and the more players are involved in providing information to the third party, the better off you are, and the more likely you'll fit within a safe harbor. Now, what, <clears throat> Joe, one thing we might want to add here is that information sharing in and of itself in the United States um, isn't a violation of the, uh, of the antitrust laws typically. If you're, if you're dealing in Europe and you're in the European community, um, just sharing information, just information sharing among competitors in and of itself can be illegal. So if you're dealing with this in Europe, uh, note that the laws are a little bit different and a little bit stricter with respect to information sharing. Yeah, good, good point. So I've been speaking, and I think all of us have from a U.S. perspective. Outside the U.S., the roles are different. We will have to do a separate webinar on that. We can't jam everything into uh, – 45 minutes or so, but but that is a very good point. The rules vary by jurisdiction, um, and, and right now it's, uh, it's probably safe to say that the U.S. is a little bit more lenient in terms of information sharing than, than certainly than Europe. Jennifer, I'm going to turn it back to you. I think we're on slide 18. Yep. So great. So I think you I think that you covered essentially like the best practices that you know people can use to benchmark. So let's move to slide 19 and talk through some common scenarios. <clears throat> you know, we talked about, you know, things actually have to have, um, you know, the purpose is to tamp down competition. Um, and so one thing that the guidance specifically said it was not addressing is non-compete agreements. So, you know, there, 
they didn't comment on agreements between employers and employees. It commented on just agreements among employers. And, you know, legislatures and courts around the country have certainly approved non-compete and non-solicitation agreements between an employer and, their, you know, its own employees. So those are acceptable. But I do want to caution you to think about you know, um, when you're trying to resolve an issue, if you have a departing employee and the new employer and the old employer have a discussion, you know, that's where you can get into hot water. Um, you say, all right, well, we'll let, we'll let this one go, but let's agree not to hire each other's, you know, sales employees. Then you're going to potentially have an issue, right? Um, you know, if, if you say, well, you know, you you know, you've offered our employee this amount of money, you know, that's not right, or we're going to offer this amount. I mean, you, all kinds of discussions can come between the two competitors that can potentially lead to the type of behavior that might be prosecuted by the antitrust division. So I would just caution you to, to take care in trying to resolve those disputes. Um, although one of the potential exceptions that we put on the slide a couple of slides back was, you know, if you're reaching a settlement agreement of a trade secret dispute, for example, you could have an agreement among employers not to poach another's um, employees. So, for example, if you had a departing employee who, who left and started soliciting people or revealed all of your salaries, you know, I can see, I can see an acceptable situation where in order to allow your confidential information to grow stale, um, it would be appropriate to have an agreement that the employer who now has this information wouldn't be allowed to poach your employees until that information went stale. So you, you can see how that might potentially work out. Um, I think benchmarking is probably the biggest minefield for employers. And, you know, this is what we talked about a little bit at the beginning where you see the CEO to CEO phone call, like with the Barclays Bank scenario. Um, I can see, you know, you've got a friend who works for a competitor. You guys, you, you know that you hire the same positions. You know, you make a call, hey, what are you guys paying your engineers? You know, we're, we've got a guy we really want to hire. And, um, you know, we want to make sure we offer something competitive. You know, is that single private phone call trying to figure out what to offer? Could that be, you know, a red flag to the DOJ? What do you guys think, Joe or, or Tom? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so, look, I, in general, I think if a single email or a single communication can be enough to sustain an investigation. Whether it's enough to sustain you know, something beyond that, a conviction is, is, is tough, obviously, without knowing more about the facts. But yeah, I mean, that's exactly how people get into the middle of an investigation is to say, this looks really suspicious. Let's figure out what happened and whether it had an effect on the marketplace. And in a broad sense, that's a very common everyday occurrence. You know, applying that to HR decisions is sort of going to be a new a new area, but in, mm -hmm. in a broad sense, it's very common. Yeah, and then, you know, if you're calling several people, hey, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? You start sharing what you find out from your friends at different companies, um, you know, and people take action based on that information, and you guys are all hiring for the same role, you know, you can see where where that could spin out into some, you know, into some dangerous activity. And then I also think that, you know, if you've got an industry group in the same city versus like a statewide industry HR group, you know, this is sort of the difference in having um, information where you have a, a sufficient number of participants so that you can't figure out who's offering what. Um, if you're looking at benchmarking, it's it's better to be part of a larger group so that you can't, you know, figure out, oh, it's my closest competitor or, you know, it's the it's the midstream company next door. I know they offer a car allowance, whereas, you know, nobody else does that. Um, it's much better to see if you can get information from a larger group. Um, and then, you know, I think one thing I just wanted to mention and, you know, especially putting on my labor and employment hat, 
is, you know, you can always ask current applicants unless you're in a uh, jurisdiction that has a law against asking for their salary history, which is kind of a new thing over the last year or two. Um, but if you ask an applicant, you know, what are you making at your current company? What are your expectations? You know, they can provide you with some of that benchmarking as well. And that's not, that's not necessarily you making an agreement or trying to get that information from a competitor to tamp down wages. So Tom or Joe, you guys have a, a thought on getting information from applicants? I, I think that's I think that's always uh, a, a little risky. The, uh, uh, the newer the person is uh, and the fresher the information is, um, the the more risk you have there. Um, you know, is that going to be enough to uh, uh, turn into a case for investigation? I'm not sure. But it's uh, it's certainly not a best practice. Yeah, it's interesting. I would I would say you know gathering marketplace intelligence is is not anti-competitive. In fact, it's arguably it's pro-competitive, right? It's the way you make a better informed decision in general, right? So if you are running a gas station, you look down the street, and you see what your competitor is offering. Well, you can say, gee, I can undercut that by a couple pennies. So so I don't generally look. It depends on the risk tolerance of the client obviously in the industry and the focus on the industry by enforcers, but in general, I don't think there's a problem with gather, unilaterally gathering competitive marketplace intelligence as long as you're not bilaterally just calling up your competitor and saying, gee, what are you doing? Because that looks an awful lot like more than a step, a couple of steps in the direction of the cartel. So if you're hiring, so you're, you're interviewing someone for a job and you obviously need to know roughly what they want to make, I don't think it's inherently problematic to say, gee, how does your former employer pay uh, other people in similar positions or different positions? Now, you know, if you're using a third party as a conduit, then that can, in effect, if you're, you know, explicitly sort of funneling information back and forth between competing companies, then that can obviously be the equivalent of a direct agreement with a competitor. So you want to avoid that situation. But just gathering the marketplace intelligence to me is is not inherently problematic and has some pro-competitive benefit potentially because it allows you to make your own unilateral decision on do you want to, again, meet, beat, or undercut uh, your competitor's price. That's the way I would look at it anyway. Well, and um, speaking of, yeah, I want to get to the takeaways, of course, but speaking of unilateral activity, we had a question that was emailed in like what if what if you and your company just unilaterally decides, you know what, um, we're worried that we might get, um, you know, a suit for trade secret violations, or we don't even want to deal with non competes or anything like that. So we're just going to choose not to not to hire at all from certain competitors of ours, and it's not because we have a deal with them; it's because we are making that choice. We don't want to take that risk. Is there any problem with doing that? I would say no, right? So, so look, nothing in life is zero risk. Yeah, of course but, not. Right? But you know, look, the, the premise of the question, uh, as phrased as I'm reading it, and as you stated, it, Jennifer, was unilateral. It's a unilateral decision. So if you, so if you already have competitor information in your files somehow, whether it's through competitive market intelligence you gathered that's public, or from a trade association benchmarking study or anything. But you make a unilateral decision on whether to hire or what to pay. It doesn't change the fact that you made a unilateral decision that you have the information in your files, right? So I, I would say that is that is a prudent. In fact, it might actually be the opposite. If you didn't, if you if you said, "Gee, I can't somehow take that into account," then it would look more like you have used the information as part of an exchange to do not make an independent decision. So I think the way it's phrased, I would say it's, it's given the unfortunate situation of having competitors' information in your file, as long as you make a unilateral decision, you've, you've taken the steps to mitigate your risk. I think, that's, I think that's probably right. I think that's probably the right analysis. The key part is to figure out why the information's in your files, whether it's from a lawsuit or from some other source but to make sure that it's not 
part of a systematic effort to exchange information and, and, and dampen price competition. Great. All right, Barbara, should we turn to the, the, uh, the takeaways? Let's do it. All right. Um, so there, there may be four or five uh, key takeaways. The first is that HR departments and your senior executives really need to be aware of the guidelines um, and the guidance, and they need to be aware of the, the very real risk that if they're criminal prosecutions, uh, people face jail time. Um, now that the agencies have announced this, um, they're going to be very focused uh, on enforcement of HR-related issues. Um, uh, this is obviously something that's gotten their interest. Uh, there have been uh, at least one speech um, by, the, uh, by the new head of the Federal Trade Commission who's commented that uh, no poach agreements um, uh, may hold down uh, wages and that in uh, today's environment and in today's economy, that's obviously not a plus, and that, that's certainly true from, uh, from an antitrust perspective. Um, uh, so one takeaway is, is that the agencies are gonna be very focused here in the future. Um, I think a another takeaway is um, just because you've got a joint venture or just because you've got a merger agreement, that is not gonna fully insulate agreements from investigation. So if your ancillary agreement um, uh, in the context of a merger or a JV is narrowly tailored and appropriate and it doesn't cover everybody in the company, it just covers uh, people who are exposed to the other side, for example, in a merger negotiation, then that's probably going to be considered um, you know, narrowly tailored. It's going to be analyzed under the rule of reason. But it doesn't mean you're going to get a free pass and there's not going to be uh, an investigation. And I think, the, I think the last takeaway here is that information exchanges and information sharing with respect to wage, wages and benchmarking wages and positions and whatnot is also going to be a, uh, a focus uh, for the agencies. Um, and we expect to see some action and some activity there as well. So uh, with that, we conclude um, uh, sort of our, our slides here. Um, we've got an announcement that we, uh, we need to make for CLE credit. Um, and uh, then if there are any questions, we'll take questions. So the announcement is the all important uh, code you need to log in to get your CLE credit. So the code is, I feel like I'm doing a lottery. This is great. <laughs> 14792, 14792 is your CLE code. All right, we've got a couple of questions which um, we will try and get to if we, it looks like we have about a minute left. So um, one of the questions is no poaching agreements in the context of settling a trade secret lawsuit. So uh, there's, there's not a lot of case law on this. In general, if you are involved in a trade secret lawsuit, um, that settles, it seems ancillary to have some sort of an agreement that says, um, obviously you will not con continue, your, the person who, who took your trade secrets will not continue to take your trade secrets. That seems pretty reasonably tailored and narrow. Whether you need to go further and say the, the, um, the company that took the trade secrets will not poach any employees I think depends on how broad the scope of that is, right? So, so if it's the precise position and type of information that was previously stolen, I guess that might be narrowly tailored enough. But then again, I'm not sure that you need to have the no poach agreement to, to accomplish that, right? So just having them agree not to follow the trade secrets law, which is what the settlement ultimately would be, seems the narrowest way to tell them that. So this, it's uncharted territory, but I think there's an, maybe an argument to have a, no, a very narrowly defined no budget agreement, but I would not want to have one that was a lot broader than that, that just said, in general, we will not poach any of your people for any purpose. So I think Jim, that's, what, do you, what do you think if like someone, someone violates a non-solicit of employees agreement, 
you know, would it be then okay to agree with an employer of the, of the former employee that because this employee has been out there poaching on behalf of that employer, then would it be okay to have a no poach agreement? Like, do you think the DOJ would go after the, um, those two employers? Yeah, I think that's the risk, right? So, so whether it's the direct, a direct agreement with another company that's hiring your people and just say, stop, let's agree not to poach each other's employees, or whether it is through a third party acting on behalf of the other company that in effect is speaking and therefore agreeing on behalf of the other company, I think that that's a risk, right? That's, that's the conduit situation I mentioned earlier, which in lots of other contexts gets companies uh, gummed up in all sorts of messy investigations and, and uh, lawsuits. So, so if I understood it correctly, I would say that that's not the path you want to go down if you can avoid it. I think that happens a decent amount because let's say you have a small company and you have a new employee that comes on board. He brings his team from the old employer. You, as the new employer, find out he had a no poach agreement with his former employer you know, you both get sued. And so how do you resolve things with the, with the old employer? You know, what if it's, hey, you can't, you both, you know, employee and employer, you're not gonna hire any more of former employer's employees for X period of months. You know, it seems to be like a reasonable way to resolve things to let the old employer shore, shore things up with its employees. and not have a complete lift out. I, I definitely see what you're saying with the conduit theory, but you know, it seems like that's how, that's how things get resolved also and uh, among, you know, when you've got litigation. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, look, that, that sounds pretty narrowly tailored in that circumstance, but this is all, again, it's uncharted waters, so we'll see how the just, uh, you know, Justice Department, the FTC, and private plaintiffs take it, but, but in that circumstance, that seems pretty narrowly tailored and has the effect of, of cutting off the litigation, obviously, as part of a settlement agreement, so there's some benefit, some, some countervailing benefit that seems to overcome the, the narrowly, the narrow restriction. And it certainly, it certainly wouldn't be criminal, it would be civil if it were prosecuted by the, um, prosecuted by the agencies, because it's not clear cut, but it's simply a, a naked poaching, anti-poaching agreement. Well, listen, we have, um, I think we've run over a little bit over our allocated time. Uh, we want to thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, for our program today. And um, if, if you have additional questions or if you want a copy of the guidance, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out um, uh, to us. Thank you very much.